trying to squeeze this in here too. Okay, so hopefully now everything, I don't want to jinx things, jinx things. But okay, so thank you all for coming. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and get started since we're already losing time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some problems related to the study of the anatomy of integers. And so I thought I would first start off by saying roughly what is the study of the anatomy of integers. Um, so some questions that people concern themselves with who study the anatomy of integers are things like studying the prime factors of integers and their size and quantity, or obtaining good bounds for the number of integers with certain properties. So for example, those with only large prime factors. Um, another question that's of interest is understanding the distribution of divisors of integers in a particular interval. So things like that. Um, when talking about the anatomy of integers, often questions focus on what is usually true as opposed to what is always true, although there are also questions about what is always true. Um, a particular question in this area that I'm going to focus on somewhat has to do with the study of the set of integers with z-dense divisors. And so when I talk about integers with z-dense divisors, what I mean is if we write out the divisors in increasing order, and then we take ratios of consecutive pairs of divisors, all those ratios have to be at most z if the integer is z-dense. And so, for example, we can see that 6 is too dense just by writing out the consecutive ratios of divisors of 6 and observing that they're all at most 2. Um, so Tenenbaum is one person who has studied the integers with z-dense divisors. And in order to study them, he was uh, looking in particular at a function called f of n, the erdos sekeresh function, um, which is defined to be 1 when n is 1. And then it's the maximum over the divisors of n times the smallest prime factors of those divisors um, when n is greater than or equal to 2. And so in particular, Tenenbaum showed that if you take f of n divided by n, that's going to be the same thing as that maximum of the ratios of consecutive divisors that I told you about. Um, and so in particular, this means that n has z-dense divisors if we can write f of n at most n times z. OK. so. One question that Tendenbaum was interested in when doing this work was trying to get upper and lower bounds for the count of integers n up to x for which n is z-dense. And so he got some upper and lower bounds, and then they were improved upon by Sias, who ultimately showed that the order of magnitude of this counting function is x times log of z over log of x. And so I'll tell you just a little bit about how Sias and Tendenbaum approached this problem. Um, so for any fixed z that's at least 2, so I'm going to fix z for a bit, um, then we can define this set d of x just to be the integers up to x, where f of n is at most n times z. And then we can define a counting function which counts integers that live in this set where the largest prime factor of n, that's the p plus of n, is at most y. And so then what we can do is we can sort of peel off prime factors, and so we can write the full count d of x, y, in terms of this uh, d of x over p comma p, where the p's are taken up to the minimum of y and some function of x. And for the integers with z-dense divisors, it's actually a good idea to take this h of x to be something like square root of x in order to make sure the error term is negligible. And if you take your h of x to be about square root of x, um, then you can create sort of a smooth version where rather than summing, we're taking an integral. And then we can say that this d of x is almost something like x times rho of u minus 1 over log x, where u is log of x over log of y, and rho is the Dickman function, but not quite. So you get something of that shape, and then you just have to sort of understand some properties of the Dickman function, and you also have to realize that this isn't quite the right shape, and so there's a lot of work that goes into getting what exactly is the right shape. But basically, all of this allows us to use tools from analytic number theory to say something about this uh, counting function for the integers with z-dense divisors. And the fact that we can peel off the prime factors sort of in this way lends itself really nicely to induction, which is one reason we want to do that. Um, so that's the general shape of the kind of argument that's used. My talk isn't really about integers with z-dense divisors, though. Um, what it's really about is how we can use these kinds of arguments to answer two particular questions. So one of the questions is how often is it the case that every number m that's between 1 and n can be written as a sum of distinct divisors of n? And then another question that we'll talk about 
is how often does the polynomial x to the n minus 1 have a divisor of every degree between 1 and n? And so these questions can both be attacked using similar techniques to the ones that I mentioned, and that's what the rest of this talk will really be on. So I'm going to first focus on that first question about sums of distinct divisors. Okay, so when an integer n, uh, we'll say that it's called practical if every number that's between 1 and sigma of n can be written as a sum of distinct divisors of n. And so we can all see very easily that 6 is practical. If we write out the divisors, you see we can make all the numbers between 1 and 6. Um, 10 is not practical. You can see that 4 and 9 both can't be written as sums of those divisors. Um, and so the practical numbers have been studied in the time since the late 1940s. Paul Erdős was one of the first people to write a paper mentioning the practical numbers. And he mentioned kind of as an aside that the practical numbers, uh, the count of the practical numbers up to x is little o of x. So they have asymptotic density 0. And uh, it's relatively easy to see that this is true. So if you want n to be practical, it has to be the case. Maybe I'll write one thing on the board, because it's easier if I write it than saying it. Um, so if you want n to be practical, we need it to be case that n is less than or equal to 2 to the tau of n, where tau here is the count of divisors function. And we need this to be true, because if we're trying to make all the integers between 1 and n as sums of divisors of n, well, this is the number of different possible sums of divisors of n, so that better be at least as big as the number of integers between 1 and n. So we need that to be true. And in order for that to be true, we need n to have a lot more than the usual number of prime factors. So that's why n has to be kind of in a set of density 0 with a huge number of prime factors. So anyway, that's, that's the first result we have on the practical numbers. Things have since been improved. So a series of papers by Hausman and Shapiro, Margenstern, Tenenbaum attempted to get more precise upper and lower bounds for the count of practical numbers up to x. And, uh, as we can see, the upper and lower bounds from Hausman and Shapiro and Margenstern were improved. But the actual best upper and lower bounds that were obtained until recently were due to Sias, who showed that the order of magnitude of this function is actually x over log of x. Um, and so I'll spend a little bit of time later talking about what Sias did, or in particular, how we can use what Sias did to say something about the polynomial divisors of x to the n minus 1. So I'm actually first going to tell you a little bit about how these questions are related to these questions about divisors of x to the n minus 1. And then I'll get a little bit more into the methodology. And I'll tell you about the state of the art with this question at the end of the talk. Um, OK, so what does this have to do with divisors of x to the n minus 1? Well, we'll define a positive integer n to be phi practical if every number that's between 1 and n can be written as a sum of phi of d's, where the d's come from the divisors of n. And so in particular, since we can write x to the n minus 1 as a product of cyclotomic polynomials, phi sub d, where the d's divide n, and since the dth cyclotomic polynomial has degree little phi of d, the Euler phi function, then trying to determine if we can make every possible degree between 1 and n by multiplying together cyclotomic polynomials is equivalent to asking, can we write every number between 1 and n as a sum of phi of d's, where the d's come from the divisors of n. So in particular, this question about uh, divisors of x to the n minus 1 will now state in terms of subsums of phi of d's. And that'll be easier for us to work with rather than thinking about factoring polynomials or multiplying polynomials. So we'll call these numbers phi practical. And so 6, you can see, is phi practical. And you could either see that by writing x to the 6 minus 1 as that product of the d cyclotomic polynomials. Or more easily, you can write out the divisors of 6, write out its totient values, and observe very easily that we can make all the numbers between 1 and 6. Um, as a non-example, we can see that 66 is, in fact, practical. So we can write all the numbers between 1 and 66, the sums of divisors of 66. And you can see that just by looking at that list of divisors. But it's not phi practical. So we're missing 7, for example, among the totient values. We can't write 7 in any way with those totient values I've listed. Um, and if you want something to work on during this talk, you can think about this question of showing that every even phi practical is practical. So I'll talk about that a little later in the talk. But if you want something to think about, there's a fun exercise. OK. So I was interested in trying to see if I could obtain results like Sias's, but for the phi practical numbers instead. And so um, the answer is yes, I can get the same order of magnitude as for the practical numbers. Um, but you might wonder, well, how does this differ from Sias's proof? So I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
Um, so Sias and all those people that I mentioned that came before Sias that worked with the practical numbers relied really heavily on the fact that we have this nice condition that's an if and only if condition for writing all of the practical numbers in terms of smaller practical numbers. So we can generate all practical numbers via this nice condition on the growth of the prime divisors. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a nice condition for generating all few practical numbers. So this really big product of primes you can see is few practical. If you want, you can check that during the talk. Um, but none of these numbers, when you truncate it, turn out to be few practical. So it turns out we can multiply on this big Mersenne prime, and suddenly it's few practical. But you know, three squared, three squared times five, et cetera, those aren't few practical. So that made it a little bit harder to deal with trying to count the number of few practicals up to x, because we didn't have that nice if and only if condition. Um, so for an upper bound, we developed kind of a cheap workaround. Um, the workaround is we define what are called weakly few practical numbers. So what we do is we take the prime factorization of n, we take mi to be the product of the first i primes written to their exact powers, and then we say n is weakly few practical if this inequality holds for all the primes. So all we need is that the i plus first prime is at most the product of the previous primes to their powers plus two. Very simple. Turns out that every phi practical number is weakly phi practical. And so if we want an upper bound for the phi practicals, it's good enough to get an upper bound for the weakly phi practicals. Um, unfortunately, that strategy is not going to work for the lower bound. Um, turns out numbers like 45 are not phi practical, but they are weakly phi practical. So this is only a, a strategy for the upper bound. Um, all right, so if we want to prove the upper bound, what we can do is split into cases. And so if n is even and it's phi practical, well, by the fact that even phi practicals are weakly phi practical, we have that pi plus 1 is less than or equal to mi plus 2. And then mi plus 2 is certainly always going to be less than or equal to sigma of mi plus 1 for all i that's at least 1. And so in particular, this tells us that pi plus 1 is at most sigma of mi plus 1, which is exactly the condition that Stewart gave us for the practical numbers. And so in particular, this says that if n is even and phi practical, it's actually just practical. So we have an upper bound for those. OK, on the other hand, let's take the odd phi practicals. Well, we can multiply them by some power of 2 and push them between x and 2x. And it turns out that by multiplying them by some power of 2, we can make them actually practical. And so it turns out that we can upper bound the number of phi practicals up to x by the number of practical numbers up to 2x. And by Sias, we know that that's going to be at most a constant times x over log x. So the upper bound is, is pretty straightforward, as you can see. Um, so Sias' approach for the lower bound, here's where we get into the integers with z-dense divisors. So Sias gets his lower bound by comparing the set of practical numbers with the set of integers with two dense divisors. And so it turns out that all integers with two dense divisors are practical. So getting a lower bound for the integers with two dense divisors is good enough to get a lower bound for the uh, practical numbers. And so that's just a reminder of the definition of two dense if you forgot what I said 10 minutes ago. But um, you can see, for example, that there are numbers that are too dense and not fee practical, like 66. So it's not exactly the case that we can't exactly say that you know, the two dense divisors will be a lower bound for the fee practical numbers. So that was another possible obstruction that we ran into. Um, but again, we can modify this just a little bit. And if we force all the inside ratios of those pairs of divisors to be strictly less than 2, and we allow the outside ratios to be exactly equal to 2, then we can call this integer strictly too dense. So we're just changing those, those inside inequalities and forcing a little bit extra on the inside uh, ratios. And it turns out that all strictly too dense integers are phi practical. And so that'll be good enough for trying to lower bound the phi practicals as if we can lower bound the integers with the strictly too dense integers. OK, so how do we lower bound the strictly too dense integers? Well, we can try to show that a positive proportion of the too dense integers are strictly too dense except possibly for some problems of small primes, which we can show aren't actually problems. Um, and so what we first do is we try to find an upper bound for the number of integers up to x that are too dense, but not strictly too dense. And so we want to find an upper bound oops, for this quantity with all the sums. And so you see we've kind of split up the numbers um, so that there's a too dense part, but then we tack on a prime that's a little bit too big that prevents it from being too dense. And then we have the rest of the number. So that's how we're splitting it up. 
And so we can use Brunsiv and a bunch of other techniques from classical multiplicative number theory in order to show that this quantity is at most some small epsilon times x over log of x. And then we just show that these small primes don't actually cause a problem. Um, and so as a corollary to our proof, we can show that the number of integers up to x that are practical but not phi practical is at least a constant times x over log x. And the number of integers up to x that are phi practical but not practical is also at least a constant times x over log x. And the same proof works to show that. OK, so I mentioned earlier there's a better result for the practical numbers. And here it is. Uh, so Weingartner in 2015 showed that we can actually get an asymptotic for the practical numbers. And so that is what he showed. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how he gets his asymptotic. So the idea here is we're going to count all the integers up to x by sort of splitting them into their practical part versus their non-practical part. And so we'll just kind of count them according to their practical part. Um, so this first part is practical. The rest of this is what prevents it from being practical. Um, so in other words, when we throw on the very next prime factor, that's where that Stewart condition fails. Um, OK, so exactly using the fact that we're partitioning them according to their practical part means that we can write the integers up to x in terms of this function phi of x over m sigma of m plus 1, where phi of, x over, phi of xy is just the number of n up to x that are y rough. Um, so we're just exactly translating this into a statement here. And so I'm copying that again. Um, so moreover, Weingartner shows that we can actually write 1 in terms of the sum of the reciprocals of practical numbers times the product of 1 minus 1 over p of the primes p up to sigma of m plus 1. Um, and that's a little bit harder to show. That involves actually using the upper and lower bounds the size gave for the count of practical numbers up to x. There's a lot more stuff going on in that argument, so I won't do that one right now. But the point is that once you have those two identities, we can then say that 0 is the same as if we take this first term and subtract the floor of x times the second term. So I just wrote all of that out like that. Um, and then we just have to observe what the sizes are of the different terms in our expression. And so we have an estimate for the count of the y rough numbers up to x. We have an estimate for the product of the 1 minus 1 over p's going up to y. And then we have an estimate for the log of sigma of m plus 1. So we can use all of those. And then we get a nicer looking expression. But then we still have to use partial summation, get an integral equation, apply a Laplace transform, and then invert the Laplace transform. So that's what Weingartner does in order to get his asymptotic. Um, and so we were interested in seeing, can we take some of these ideas and try to get an asymptotic for the phi practicals? And so the answer is yes. So along with Carl Pomerantz and Andreas Weingartner, um, we got an asymptotic for the phi practicals. And I thought this picture was sort of timely uh, compared with the one I was going to do, which was a picture of Carl and I in our PhD robes. So anyway. Um, and so how do we get an asymptotic for the phi practicals? Well, what we can do is we can do the same kind of thing that Weingartner does. So remember, he enumerated them according, like he took numbers and he took the full set of integers and partitioned them according to their practical part. We're going to try to partition numbers in terms of this square full part that has sort of a unique few practical component to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that a starter is a few practical number m so that either m divided by the largest prime factor of m is not phi practical, or the largest prime factor of m squared divides m. And so we can observe that phi practical number n then will have starter m if m satisfies the definition of starter listed above. If m is an initial divisor of n, meaning that the largest prime factor of m is smaller than the smallest prime factor of n over m. And finally, if n over m is square free. So as some examples, because I know this is sort of a strange definition, um, you can show that 4 is the only starter that has square full part 4. Uh, there are exactly three starters that have square full part 49, and those are two from 294, 1470, and 735. And then there are infinitely many starters that have square full part 9. So uh, you know, the number of starters with a particular square full part, as you can see, varies quite widely. Um, but that doesn't cause any problems for us. So what we do in our argument 
is we partition the phi practical numbers according to their starters. So we write them all in terms of m times b, where m is the starter and b is the rest of the number. And it turns out that every phi practical number has a unique starter, so you can totally do this. And then what we do is we use Weingartner's machinery to show that for any fixed m, so for any fixed starter, um, we can find sequences of real numbers cm and rm so that we can write this counting function bm of x, which is the number of phi practicals up to x with starter m, in terms of this constant cm times x over log x plus an error term that's not too large. Um, and then the worry is just, well, what happens when we sum these c sub -ams and these r sub -ams over all the possible m's? Could those get big? And so what we end up showing in the end is that these sums are both finite, and so they don't cause any problems for us. Um, so that's the idea. And then uh, one of the reasons in particular that we uh, have the starter contain the square full part is because then the rest of the number, the b, is square free. And so it turns out that the square free, so if n is square free, then it's phi practical if and only if it's weakly phi practical. And remember, weakly phi practical meant it had that really nice inequality on the prime factors. It had an if and only if condition. You can make every weakly phi practical via this condition on prime factors. And so then Weingartner's machinery goes through really nicely on the square free numbers. Um, and so it's a lot easier to kind of start with a fixed square full part and then tack on additional primes that are distinct from the square full part. Um, so that's why we do that the way that we do. Okay, so you might be wondering through all this, all right, you have an asymptotic, well, what does the asymptotic constant look like? The answer is we don't know. Uh, but we have some computations that maybe suggest approximately what the constant should look like. So uh, as far out as we could take this, which was about a 39-day computation um, using the Max Planck Computers Distributed Network, um, we were able to get uh, this constant for f of x divided by x over log x to be something like 0 0.98. Um, of course, this column is like strictly decreasing, so we don't know how much farther it's going to decrease. So maybe the, maybe the logarithmic integral is a better model for what we should be comparing our count of phi practicals with. I don't know. Um, so if you compare with the logarithmic integral instead of with x over log x, it seems like maybe it's oscillating somewhere around 0.95 or something like that. Um, so anyway, I don't know. It seems likely that the constant is something a little bit less than 1. That's, that's what I would predict. Uh, I don't, there's not really a philosophical reason. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good heuristic argument for why it should be a little less than, you know, it's not clear why there should be slightly fewer fee practicals on the number of primes. Like, that's sort of cool, but I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to think more about why the constant is what it is, but we haven't gone down that road. Um, so I wanted to end my talk just in the last couple of minutes by mentioning a generalization of some of this work. Um, so rather than taking sums of f of d's, or f sums of phi of d's, we could take sums of f of d's, where we let f's be different arithmetic functions, um, sort of a natural question that someone might ask. So we can define s sub f of m just to be the sum of f of d's, and uh, taken over all the divisors of n, which is the same as the convolution of f with the function that's uniformly 1. And then um, we can define f practical numbers just to be the integers n where every positive number up to s sub f of m, so notice this is not going all the way up to n, it's going to s sub f of n, um, then there's going to be a set of divisors of n where we can write the m's in terms of those f of d's. So in particular, we see that when we let f be the identity function, then we get exactly the practical numbers back. And when we let f be the Euler phi function, then we get the phi practical numbers back. And this makes sense with the definition of s sub f of m, because remember, for the practical numbers, we took them actually all the way up to sigma of n. And so that makes sense as the sort of analog for how far you take the values of m. Um, OK, so what functions can we play around with? Can we define f practical numbers for? Um, we can see that when we let f be the tau function, so again, the count of divisors function, that's how I'm defining tau, um, then we see that all positive integers are tau practical. And uh, we can also show that the set of lambda practical numbers, where lambda is the Carmichael lambda function, so here it's the universal exponent of the multiplicative group of units mod n, um, that, that, that set is going to have asymptotic density zero. And we can also construct all kinds of weird piecewise functions with different asymptotic densities, like we made this one that has density a half. So we've got density one, density zero, density a half. 
it might make you wonder, well, what densities can we get? Can we classify the set of densities we can get? Um, so I had, a, I had a student this summer at the Max Planck Institute. I was, I was there on my sabbatical, and I had a high school intern. And my high school intern worked with me on this. That's him right there. His name is Nicholas Schwab. And so he and I showed that for every natural number, we can construct one of these piecewise functions, f sub n, using exactly the idea in that bottom example that I gave. Um, so that the asymptotic density of the f sub n, f sub n practical numbers is 1 minus phi of n over n. And so what this means, if we apply a result of Schoenberg, which says that the values of phi of n over n are dense in the interval from 0 to 1, then as a corollary, we see that the densities of f practical sets are dense in the interval from 0 to 1. So that's a nice, densities are dense things, say. Um, so some other things we can show. We classified the multiplicative functions f for which there's a Stewart-like condition um, describing how to determine the f practical numbers. So remember that the practical numbers we could completely determine via this if and only if condition. The phi practical numbers we couldn't determine via this if and only if condition. So there's this contrast. And so using our criterion, we can check that, in fact, the phi practical numbers aren't going to be determinable via this if and only if condition, and the practical numbers are. Um, we can also prove Chebyshev type bounds for certain f practical sets. So when uh, we have that, say, f of p to the k is approximately f of p to the k, these are the arithmetic functions that, or the multiplicative functions that are kind of interesting to study in terms of the densities. You know, these are the ones where the density is not going to be, you know, it's not going to be like you've got some finite number of f practical numbers or it's all of the natural numbers. So these are going to be the ones where you get something that's between those two extremes. And so in particular, some of the ones that we found interesting to study were the Carmichael lambda function, the um, Euler totian function, the unitary totian function, different things like that where you do have that kind of condition on the arithmetic function f. Um, finally, we studied the additive functions, and we classified the functions f for which all positive integers are f practical. So like the little omega function, the big omega function, counting the prime factors of n. Um, turns out omega practicals and big omega practicals, that consists of all of the integers, positive integers. So anyway, that's just some of the stuff that I worked on with my intern. Um, sort of following the other work that was a little bit more analytic. I guess I will go ahead and end there, but thank you very much for listening. So I worked on a paper with Paul Pollock where we studied what we called additive endpoints where you're sort of, rather than going all the way up to sigma of n, you're sort of saying like, well, how far you know, can you take the sums, like, like how much of an interval can you cover with sums of divisors before you hit a gap? Um, and so we have a whole separate paper on that, but it gets, like, it's, it's, is that kind of what you're asking is like, if you're trying to go, okay. Uh, no, right. <laughs> or, oh. Can you write a bigger one? Yeah, I mean, if you have a big enough, you, you mean if you have a big enough integer, you can write a big prime as a sum of the divisors. I mean, it depends on what the divisors are of n. But yeah, yeah, we haven't we haven't looked so much at that. That's an interesting question, though. Thank you.